Hi, everyone, and welcome to the SciPy Ontario seminar series. My name is Rachel MacArthur, and I will be your moderator for today's session. You will remain in lecture mode for the duration of the call. If you have any questions, please send them through the chat pod located in the bottom right of your screen. Today's session is called Lean, Efficient, and Effective Services in the Public Health Se in Public Sector. The presenter is Glenn Tompia. Glenn Tombia has led continuous improvement initiatives in manufacturing, financial services, and in health services sector. He has been with the region of Peel Health Department for over five years, most recently as a process specialist. Glenn received a Bachelor of Commerce in Marketing Management from the University of Guelph, a Master's Certification in Lean Six Sigma Black Belt from Villanova University, and is a graduate of the Master of Business Administration Sustainable Commerce Program at the University of Guelph. I'll hand it over to Glenn now. Thank, thank you for joining me. <clears throat> Can everyone hear me? Yeah. I'm just going to keep going. All right. Um, so for today's session, what we're going to cover is what is Lean. I'm also going to provide an overview of some of the process mapping tools, um, such as a SIPOC, uh, process maps, and the value stream. Um, as well as some process analysis tools, namely the five whys, fishbone, and Pareto analysis. And at the end, we'll, we'll take some time to answer some of your questions along the way. The goal of this session is to ensure that you understand some of the key concepts in Lean, to identify opportunities to be more efficient in your service delivery, and also share some information and some helpful tools along the way. All right? As you can see, I've shared in the PowerPoint there some little how this exercise looks like when you're doing an organizational-wide kind of process improvement initiative. What a uh, quick overview of what Lean is. So what Lean is is a method for identifying and delivering what the client needs are and eliminating any process or task that doesn't add to the delivery of that product or service. It is also a framework to achieve continuous gains in productivity while satisfying the client's expectations for that service quality. And lastly, it's an opportunity to collaborate across organizations or even with other service providers to improve that client experience and the quality of the service delivered. Some of the quick myths I wanted to kind of share about Lean that we continuously hear is that um, what it's lean is not, it's not trying to improve the system by making people work harder or do the, doing the same with fewer people. It's also not a short-term project, and it's not limited to manufacturing plants or business processes. And lastly, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. So when you're leading some lean initiatives, some of the things I wanted to share that you need to do is that you need to focus on the customer. You need to identify and understand how the work gets done, which we call the value stream. And you need to manage, improve, and smoothen out that process flow and how information and communication and steps change hands. Where possible, you need to remove any non-value-added steps and what we deem as waste, and then we'll talk about that later on in the slides. Manage by facts and reduce variation. So very often, quite often, people manage by gut feelings, but you want to use facts um, as best as possible. You want to involve and equip the people in the process. We always say that there are good people stuck in a broken process, and so we need to understand why it is that way. You also want to undertake improvement activities in a systematic way. So first thing I want to um, discuss today is what is value to our customer? Right? So um, the thing when we say a value add to the customer is that if you thought about the customer or the community that you serve, it'd be something if you almost put a price to it, they'd be willing to pay for it. The task activities undertaken uh, changes or physically transforms. All right? So if you're passing off information on the steps and the, per the next stakeholder or the next person doesn't actually physically transform or the attributes of that process or product doesn't change, you need to ask yourself if there's value in that handoff. And also, it's done right the first time to meet the client requirements. That's what we deem as value add from the client's perspective. But there are also times when it's not just about value add, but there's some business value add, meaning that steps like, you know, so for 
um, due to legal reasons, financial reasons, or compliance reasons, the client may not deem it as valuable, but the business needs to do these steps or else runs the risk of legal risk, financial uh, ruins, and things like that. And it also contributes to running the organization and is, direct, is indirectly providing value to that customer. All right? Everything else that doesn't fit that need, we deem as non-value add, or we call it waste. All right? And it doesn't mean that the person is wasteful. It just means that that step does not add value to from the client's perspective, and does not value add from the business perspective as well. So these steps do not contribute directly to fulfilling the client's needs, and there's not a business need to actually undertake that step at all. Right? So our goal here is that we want to eliminate all waste, and where possible, we want to minimize the time required to conduct the business value added steps. Right? So if you're thinking about the from the public sector perspective, value is any process step activity that changes so that the customer, the community is aware of it, and if you were to put a price to it, they would be willing to pay for it. All right? And there's been lots of ways to be able to classify waste. Um, for some people who are not new to lean, they may have heard of Tim Woods. I like downtime because when you're talking about lean and being efficient, time is of the essence. And so I like downtime as an acronym to help key people into where some of the time traps are or where some of the waste can be um, hidden. All right, so I'm going to go through a few different examples from a public health spec uh, sector example so that you guys can maybe kind of anchor yourself around some of these kind of eight ways in the service delivery. So the, the downtime is the acronym. Um, it stands for defect, the D being defect. So um, it's efforts caused by rework, scrap, or incorrect information. So if you're thinking about your work, um, defect is any wrong expression types. Um, input it into your hedgehog system, or duplicate inspections or incorrect information in hedgehog fields, non-mentor non fields, which do not provide accurate data. When we talk about overproduction, and this is one that a lot of people are, get challenged with, is production that is more than needed or before it is actually needed. So you're doing more than you actually need, or you did so much more before someone actually triggers that. So if you think about overproduction um, from your work, that could be conducted too many reinspections on a past compliance inspection, right? Because resources are tied to it, um, right? If you do too much before it's needed as well. So you have to think about the resource and the capacity within your system as well. Uh, weeding, uh, if you think about waste, and, you know, wasted time waiting for the next process step. Right, so um, waiting, so not enough information from the client uh, from the first client contact, which results in waiting for the client to call back with more information before, let's say, a rabies PEP can be delivered. Um, Non-utilized intellect, so uh, non-utilized intellect or non-utilized talent is underutilizing people's talent, skills, and knowledge. Right, so if you think about that, um, so if you in your work, it could be allowing staff to initiate quality. Uh, continuous quality improvement as part of their performance metrics. Right? The people who do the work oftentimes have the best solutions. We just have to enable them to be able to think about how do they actually improve the work, their day-to-day -day work right? and using like the lean thinking methodology to help them uh, to achieve that. Transportation is any unnecessary movement of product or material. So if you think about it, it's kind of planning your inspection routes to reduce any unnecessary trips that you may do. Um, inventory is excess products and materials not being processed. Uh, not being processed. So if you think about inventory, it's kind of like ordering too many rabies vaccines, which may expire before it's used. Uh, motion is unnecessary movement by people, i.e., walking, searching, and things like that. So at our facility, one of the things we did here at the region was we moved our supply and sample collection room from the eighth floor to the main floor to reducing any unnecessary motion and wasted time for our public health inspectors. And it's also the ideal location for our courier pickup. So we're kind of getting that closer to uh, the source where people would need it the most. And extra processing is more work or higher quality than is required by the customer. We like to please and you know we deem that as quality improvement, but there are times where we're spending too much time processing where capacity could be better utilized elsewhere. So if you're thinking about unnecessary steps, 
in your work could be unnecessary, unnecessary steps when compliance or investigations are received which do not add value to the client and are not needed for ministry data. All right, so that's the one way to kind of think about downtime and where waste could be. So when you're thinking about analyzing your processes, that's a good place to go. The one thing I also, when I'm talking about clients and the customer's perspective, is that how can we make the customer aware of some of the intangible services that we provide? So um, on your screen, what you're seeing is kind of like the two different models. So one is kind of like what Burger King is known for is like you can have it your way. So burgers are prepared on the spot the way you like it versus a Big Mac, which is often prepared in advance and things like that. And because we start to realize that, you know, sometimes we provide a package to a customer and maybe it may be not be as value. So if you think about when you're traveling nowadays, if you think about maybe 10 years ago to now, Everything has been kind of decoupled. You want to check your bag, there's additional cost related to it. Um, I've seen even headsets cost $5 to all the things, right? Because everybody's traveling, lots of people are traveling with an iPad. And so you're also starting to see those TV screens in front of you have also disappeared and maybe at the top of the screen. But what I'm really trying to get across here is that uh, we do this for food premises. Right. So when you think about the inspections you may conduct in your day-to-day -day work, we have kind of like we use the high, medium, and low risk food categories to determine the frequency and the time spent at each inspection. Right. So maybe low risk maybe annually, uh, medium risk maybe twice a year, and high risk more frequently. Knowing that you know those customer perspectives are different. Right. So we want to specify it as well. All right. Um, one of the things I wanted to bring to your attention is so now that we're diving into kind of how do you start to do some analysis to figure out where is that process waste and how can we also uh, improve our product or services. One way to do that is to map out the current state. So you actually go out and go, okay, how are these things done? You observe and you map it out in a process. And there are three things that often typically happens. One is that what people think it is, which can be, you know, cumbersome, what people think it should be, which can be short, and then you come to find out what it actually is, it's a bit of a messy. It's a bit more messier than the two examples I used prior. Um, what you think it is, is dangerous because you're relying on assumptions that may not be accurate. What, should, what it should be is also dangerous because you're jumping to a solution without having completed the appropriate analysis or data collection. And what it actually is is the most insightful because it eliminates any assumptions and replaces them with facts and leads to a correct focus on the effort by the team. All right, so process mapping can be used to eliminate any steps in your current process which are delaying initiating of a file or increasing the overall service response times that you may be um, challenged with in your work. All right, there are lots of different process mapping tools as I mentioned. I'm going to start with one of the high-level kind of uh, process mapping notations that I've used in the past, and it's called SIPOC. And the SIPOC is in like a, a Star Trek thing. What it actually means is acronyms, and I know I'm throwing a lot of acronyms at you folks today, but what it actually is is the S is supplier who provides an input, which is the I, right, and, which, and you do some value-added process steps there, which is our P, and that creates an output to the customer. Output being our O and customer being our C. So in front of the, in the slide deck you're currently looking at, um, I've provided a visual tool um, kind of kind of highlighting like how I got here today. So if you think about, and this is really good when you're starting kind of scope out the work or a mapping that you may do. It's like I woke up today, uh, I did some grooming, I got dressed, I packed my lunch. And then I dropped the kids off and I arrived at my destination. If you're looking at the process swim lane, that little, the column for process. But to be able to do those processes, there are inputs that trigger me to be able to know. Right? So to wake up, the input was a loud noise, which is my alarm. Right? Sometimes that loud noise, I have two young kids at home. It's my kids going, Daddy, I'm up, or my wife saying, Hey, you're almost late. Right? And that output is that you know, from the grooming, I'm ready for work. I have meals for work, and then I arrive on time. Uh, right? The customer sometimes is, you know, 
my friends, my audience, my work, right? And that helps you. Like, and usually the side talk is, you know, five to seven high-level major steps that help you kind of discuss what the scope is to figure out what are some of those triggers to the steps, who provides that, and the customer. And the reason the supplier customer point view uh, point of view is so important is that then you know who your stakeholders are. The inputs are good ways to know if your triggers are in the right place to kind of set you off to actually start an activity. And the output helps you define what good looks like at the end of it all. A SIPOC tool, is, for the most part, is just a high level step that helps you kind of scope out the work that you're going to uncover. A process map or flow chart, if, for the folks that may not know this, um, it's a workflow diagram that creates um, an understanding of a process or a series of steps uh, in parallel processes. All right, and so um, if you're looking at the screen right there, what you'll see is that kind of like your oval shape. Those are what we call process terminators. It shows your starts and your endpoints. The arrows kind of are your process flow of where information goes. The rectangle is a process step. Um, and a diamond is really a decision, and what the last icon is your data flow. So if you're looking right here, what you see is that that's your data flow, All right? All right. So and the other key components of kind of process notation, if you and this is mostly done in Visio. I've seen people use um, simple Word documents to create some of these these kind of process notation, and this is really good to see where information switches between stakeholders. So in the example I'm providing, I provided a high-level rabies investigation. You'll see that there's an external uh, stakeholder, let's say the hospital in this example, who triggers, provides a trigger, right? Um, I call comes into a health unit or a fax is sent or an email comes in, which then the process step is our administrator. So you can see different, three different stakeholders here that you may have to engage. The steps that are undertaken by an administrator, the system is fit into, right, in the document flow as well, and then the work that's uncovered by our staff, our public health inspectors. You can see that the decision here, usually what you get, end up getting is when you're making a decision, to think through kind of like your go or no go or yes or no type decision. It helps kind of anchor people around. When you're trying to get process standards in place, how to actually do these notations. I really like this because it shows you all the different handoffs that occur, right? When you start to, when you start to do these, um, you start to see how messy your process can be. A value stream map is really just a, a pictorial representation of how things flow through a system from beginning to end. So thinking through kind of the client journey, all the information flow um, along the way and things like that. It is used to highlight any inefficiencies in our current system, um, i.e. waste, your flow issues, and examples of variability. Right? And it also provides a great kind of framework for, uh, for opportunity identification and solution development, uh, kind of your solution design phase. So if you're thinking about it, uh, the value stream map is um, your 10,000 foot level. Your process map sits maybe at your 10,000 uh, foot level. Um, and sometimes it can get really into the weeds. So value stream, your process, and then your steps and tasks kind of sit kind of more in your weeds. So I'm going to share with you a bit of a value stream map. Please don't be intimidated by this at all. Um, it's what, what you see the differences between this versus a process maps. You can start to determine when this would be a good good utilization of your time and resources to uncover. So one thing you see about the value stream map is kind of like it is that it's a visual tool for documenting the highest level of a business process from beginning to end. There's lots of process notations here, but the one thing I want to show you is that there is an information flow that comes from your client, a customer, and suppliers. In case you're getting supplied information, think about your SIPOC for a second. Um, your, process, your product or process flow, so if you're thinking about intake, high level verification, any decisions that get made, and how you get it to your service output. The one key difference between a value stream map versus your process map is that while it shows you the activities, the great thing about a value stream map is the timeline. So it shows you how long things take, usually in minutes, how long 
things wait in queue, um, hours, and things like that. And it's really great to be able to better understand how much lead time you need to be able to take an, uh, go from intake to service delivery, and also understand how much processing time is, on, is uh, also underneath. In here is typically where people know like the resourcing level, so you know how many people are involved and things like that. So this notation here is any kind of your client external organization. This process block right, shows you kind of you know how long does the process take. You may also list how many people are involved, the number of shifts, and it can get really kind of you can put a lot of data points in there as well. Um, here's where you can kind of start to see maybe if there's a bottleneck. Maybe that's where we start to focus our process efforts to try to reduce that bottleneck. If you shorten that, these hours into minutes, you improve your entire client experience and your entire process flow. This is something that, you know, if you start to think about, you know, you run into an issue where people are saying there's an imbalance, this is a place you can also start to look at. All right. So I, I know I gave you a lot, but I wanted to kind of share some of these tools because I think when you start to do some of these process maps or you want to start to look at things that are not working, these are tools that are available. They're, you know, you can Google them online on the Internet and see it. And I'm going to share some quick tools at the end of the session so you can know where to also go. But some of the tips and tricks for generating a process map is that, you know, you may start by yourself, but my map is a uh, team exercise. So you want to validate it with other people to make sure that you know what you you saw or you know what's actually happening is validated. You want to think in terms of the process and not the people, right? Um, when you're actually doing this, include any informal information flows as well. Sometimes you know people are doing all these extra steps, maybe doing Excel. Um, little Excel tips and tweaks, writing stuff down on paper to keep track of what things are happening. And so that's also important to capture because there's sometimes, at times there are uh, resource or time uh, spent on that part as well. You want to focus on getting a good snapshot of the actual process. When you're stuck and people are not sure and the ranges, you know, you can see, it's okay, just give me like ballpark it for me, you know, from how long to what. So sometimes you may just, get a snapshot and it may not be perfect, like five minutes, could be five to ten minutes. Um, you want to use pencils and post-it notes like I shared in the first slide because you know it, people change it all the time. So for me, I have brown paper, I roll it across the wall and I use post-it notes to help and that moves things around as other people validate it. And you also don't want to jump to developing corrective actions for potential root causes that are identified. All right. So remember the value stream map I shared a few sli uh, slides ago? When you're thinking about those hours in between, it's really about trying to identify where that flow uh, comes to a halt or where that bottleneck is in that process. So one example is like, picture this. You're calling a, you're calling a client to log a complaint. So that client, the first call comes to, in our system, we have different tiers. So it comes to tier one where all calls are logged and then you're pushed into a different queue, right? And in that tier one, let's say three clients are coming through per hour and then you get pushed into kind of like health only type calls where, let's, where we call it tier two in your, in your slide here, right? Um, let's say two clients are going through per hour and then you get pushed into an admin queue where maybe four clients are going through and then you finally get to your your PHI queue where maybe six clients are going through. If you think about that queue rather than steps, what you start to see is that, hey, maybe like if if I focus on tier two where only two clients are going through, that means you know every call is taking two hours and I can find improvements at that point and focus all my effort there, then I would improve the total journey. If you focus on, let's say, uh, the end, Right, regardless, even if you, sh uh, you improve this, the clients are still stuck somewhere here. Yeah, right? If five people are calling or more than two people are calling, someone's always waiting. In their experience, it may not be a good one. And right, that's why it's really important to figure out where that bottleneck is in information and handoffs and focus on that bottleneck. Continue to reduce that bottleneck. Then you move to the next biggest bottleneck. 
That's how you want to make that entire flow more efficient. So one of the goals, the, one of the things I want to share here is that like an hour gained on the bottleneck is an hour gain for the entire system if you're focusing on the biggest bottleneck. But an hour gain in a non-biggest bottleneck is just a mirage, meaning that you may improve that part. But if I'm stuck further upstream or I'm stuck in like the earliest steps, I'm still frustrated by the time I get to the improved state you are at. All right. Um, one of the other things I wanted to share is that when you think about demand, so how much requests are coming in and capacity, i.e., how many how much resource are able to respond to that, if there's an imbalance between demand and capacity, it causes a waste. Wait, right? Because if, if, let's say, more calls are coming in than you, you have enough people to respond to it, somebody's waiting in queue, if you think about it from that perspective. So if, if we're thinking about from our point of view, right, most queues occur when there's a mismatch in demand and capacity. So if you're thinking about your work, I would say during certain times in the year, there's an increase in influx of communicable disease reports and investigations due to more people traveling to exotic places. So more people are getting sick in December and January months. In the summer months, we also see an increase in rabies cases. So if you think about in both of those cases, it makes sense to increase resources to respond to that demand, right? So for thus a floater role that supports both of these seasonal fluctuations could be a reasonable way to kind of address some of that challenges as well. The one key thing I want to share about this slide really is that oftentimes it may feel like demand is unpredictable, but when you look at it from a, like from a broader view, demand is very predictable. And also the, other, the second key point I want to make here is that unused capacity is lost and you can never get it back. So let's say someone, somebody on my team has available capacity today and we, we don't find a proper way to utilize that uh, capacity today, it's lost and we can't gain it tomorrow. Right? So if someone has an hour today, and we don't use it today, and tomorrow the clock starts again because that hour isn't available to utilize, right? And if you schedule by feel, you'll always get it wrong. So I want you to start thinking about how do we look at our demand and how do we also resource, or how do we also shift our capacity to respond to that, if that makes any sense. Now we're going to move into a bit of our analysis. So uh, the demand capacity was an introduction to thinking through analysis along the way, right? So um, the difference in issue tree and a hypothesis tree is that it's um, data-driven, why? Where hypothesis is driven by the how. So if you're thinking about data-driven, why? It begins with the problem and it breaks it down to a solution, right? So uh, data-driven why is like an example being the issue tree being like the five whys and fishbone, so you don't know why, and so you start asking the why questions, where hypothesis is like, I know something isn't work, it begins with a potential solution, and develops rationale to validate or disprove it. I, like, I think this is a problem, and then I, I start putting things in place to validate if my hypothesis is true. If not, it's disproved, and you move on to another one. So we're going to go into a bit of like the issue. I like the issue tree because you're asking, like, here's a problem, and let's break it down further. And you start with, here's my solution, and then trying to val uh, validate or disprove it, your null hypothesis type thinking. I, I think the issue tree is almost the simplest way to, do, uh, to start. It's a nice, simple place to start. So root cause, problem solving, some of the tips and tricks before we get into kind of how to actually do it is that, you want to talk less and listen more. You want to take the emotion away before you begin the process. You want to use root cause problem solving sessions to build relationships with people. And you want to be cautious to not use the five whys in an aggressive way or condescending way. And be patient. Right? Um, when you're drilling down to the five whys, resist that opportunity to propose an answer right off the bat. Um, and then time spent in finding the right root cause will save you lots of time and frustration later on. I can promise you that. And some problems have se uh, several root causes, which uh, makes so make sure that you actually identify as many as you can, so that when you start to actually test your hypothesis, you you have everything on the table and you kind of start going one at a time, being systematic. So um, what you're looking at is a fishbone diagram. Um, 
is created by a guy named Ishikawa. And that's why I call it fishy ishy. Um, if it'll help you. Um, and and I, what you're looking here is kind of like the bones of that fish bone. Um, here's the effect. So you can start with, you know, we have long turnaround times for investigation. And here's the different causes. I think there's, some, there's different ways to break down kind of what are the potential causes. I like process steps in breaking down where that effect is happening. So if you're thinking about that we have long turnaround times for our investigation process, and you break down the process of admin, the administrator, or admin gathering that information, what are some of the different examples, right? And then assigns it to an inspector. What are some of the different causes that lead to that long turnaround time? And then when the visit or that inspection is conducted, what are some of those causes? The reason I like a process step, to be quite honest with you, is you can kind of start to tackle some of those process areas where some of those causes attribute to the effects are, right? Um, and so it's nice. It's a nice way to kind of see. Oh, I see lots of problems or causes attributing to that effect, the long turnaround time. So maybe I might start here, or I might start somewhere else. And sometimes it's easier to focus on that stakeholder group, right? So that's why I like to break it down by kind of the fishbone, right? It just allows you to be able to identify and brainstorm all the issues related to that process step there. All right, so uh, I know I've shared some of the tips and tricks. Uh, for fishbone diagram, establish team norms and rules before starting that root cause analysis. Specifically, team must resist that temptation to assign blame, intent, or emotion. Stay focused. It's easily for individuals and teams to go kind of off tangent. Um, I would <laughs> I would tell you to establish a parking lot and use it to address uh, problems and issues that are identified but out of scope for the current like analysis that you're doing. And remember to use the five Y technique to create kind of like your sub factors in that fish phone in that like process area. All right. So we're going to go into a bit of the hypothesis testing. All right. Um, if you, I do not. So one example I'm using here, and I wanted to use a simple one um, rather than use a specific one to your work in case not everybody on the call is an inspector, but I think everyone is. Um, like, so one example is <laughs> I feel like I don't have enough, um, you know, I feel I do not feel my bank account that properly reflects my financial genius I am. So I feel like I don't have enough money. So how do you test your hypothesis, right? So you're going to start with how can I have more money at the end of the day at the end of the day or the end of the month without incurring any debt. There's two hows, right? And if you start with the how, one is you're either going to increase your income or you're going to reduce your expense. So if you start with increase my income, I'm going to win something, big win so I'm going to receive money from my investments. I'm going to receive money from my work. I'm going to put some more time in, make more money. I'm going to invest and make money, or I'm going to be lucky, right? So that windfall, how? There's legal ways, illegal ways. Any, or I'm going to inherit or win the lottery. You can kind of see how we go with the how, how, how. It's almost like your why, why, why in a second, um, right? And then if you go reduce my expenses, I'm going to buy less. I'm going to pay less for the same items. So you go, how do you buy less? You can kind of go look at all the things you currently buy and look at what you can eliminate. Or you buy lower quality or you shop around for specials on the Internet. So you can kind of see how you get to something you can action at the end. Once you get to something you can action, like I'm going to inherit money, or I'm going to get a better paid job, or do additional, uh, get a new a side hustle, or do some overtime, you can start to see something you can action. Once you ask the how, 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 if you get to something actionable, that gives you a step to go, okay, now I can start piloting something. I can start testing some of these. All right. The um, one of the things I also wanted to share is a Pareto. Um, pastel Pareto is this person. You don't need to worry about it, but you've heard it uh, in your life one way, shape, or form. That is that rule of thumb that 80% of the problem is caused by 20% of the causes, right? Um, and so one example is, um, yeah. So one example is kind of like, you know, 20% of the people in the world, you know, have 80% of the wealth, same kind of thinking. So one of the things you do once you get into it, so another form of analysis is like, and this example is actually, um, oops, sorry, let's go back here, is actually an example for reasons for not initiating our rabies case in 24 hours. Once you start to break down all the reasons, 
and you see the frequency of occurrence, you can start to see like here we have about 80% breakdown. So once you do your count of how often it happens, you start to see these are my big four things I want to tackle, right? So files I receive late on Friday evening, which means that it, you know clearly we're a Monday to Friday shop. We're going to miss our deadline. So how? What are some interventions we can do for one, those late Friday uh, files we get, or files are received over the weekend by phone and things like that? So once you start to break down like the frequency of causes, you can start to see oh these are my big hitters. And I want to focus a lot of my effort and time on that. So I want to bring back an example in your context that could be a bit more relatable, which is reasons for delay. And so I talked about the case being late on a Friday, and it's not input into your hedgehog system for later. Case, the case may come in after hours, and it's not ha handled appropriately by the PHI, who may be or may not be on call. The case is misassigned to the wrong person could be another one of those causes that has increased the cause of the lost time and us not being able to meet our service kind of quality of 24 hours, or the case is received by fax on the weekend and we don't have a proper process for that. So, um, so when you start to take a deeper dive, you can start to see where is the areas that we can fix. So if you focus on the major causes, then, you, then you're focused on the biggest bang for your buck, as I've, I've said before. All right. Um, I'm a little ahead of time, which is good because we have about, about 12 minutes ahead of time, which is going to allow us for more Q&A in a second. But I wanted to share lots of resources. So um, the, uh, the service design tool is one of the good resources I like to look at. Um, there's a book. I, I, don't, I have no affiliation with them, but I think like Learning to See by uh, Rother and Shook is one of the good examples. And also, this is system design thinking. But honestly, if you, if you enter into Google and go lean tools or some of the tools I've shared today, the internet is a rich place to go to be able to find a lot of these tools. Um, you can send me an email. But yeah, there's lots of tools to help you start thinking about different ways to actually deliver service or to even look at the way you actually conduct your day to day that would benefit from putting a lean lens to it. All right. Uh, I want to thank you for your time, and I think at this time I'm going to turn it back to our moderator to uh, to initiate the Q and A period. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Glenn. We'll just wait a few minutes and see if anybody has any questions uh, to enter in the chat box. Great presentation, but I know a lot of health units are starting to uh, implement some of these strategies. Uh, and I know here at Durham, a lot of the inspectors here are going for the lean training and um, looking at ways to become more efficient. Yeah, it's um, it's one of my passion areas, and I, I think like so often it's just um, underutilized, and whether it's because of lack of knowledge or interest or Whatever, I think it could benefit in so many different ways. And you know, if you think about the political climate, you know, we need to find ways to work um, as effective and efficient as we can. Um, and so, this is one way to kind of look at your work, and analyze it, and you know, find improvement and efficiencies. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right, so it doesn't seem like anybody has any questions. So I just want to thank everyone who joined us today for the Sci-Fi Ontario seminar series. Um, there was some good participation um, for those that were online. And I'd like to thank Glenn and Tavia for presenting as well today and his time um, to put this presentation together. Please be sure to complete the evaluation form that will be sent out after the session as well. And then our next Sci-Fi seminar series will be taking place on Wednesday, January 8th. And it will be on the progressive compliance cycle, which will speak about maintaining your PDHs for members and consequences for failure to maintain professional competencies. So this will be presented by the Sci-Fi Council of Professional Experience, which is COPE. Um, so it will be a really good session for people to attend because I think this is a new model that they're starting to implement. And that will be next year. So have a great day, everyone, and stay warm. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you.